Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church. If you would tonight, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. And we're going to study about the bishop. And tonight's Bible study is very important to deal with all of Christianity and divine nature. And it comes from understanding uh, the entire Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, nor striker, nor greedy, nor of filthy liqueur, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruled well his own house, having his children subjects in all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings, and we thank you for all that we have and enjoy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Bible is teaching us in the pastoral position, uh, the relationship of Christ to the church. They are all intertwined. Uh, there needs to be such an understanding. Now, if a man desired the office of bishop, he desireth good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So that means all religions that have unmarried ministers are not qualified. Female ministers are not qualified according to God's word. If people are in submission to biblical teaching of God's word. Now blameless is not sinless. But it is to be without fault in the marital relationship and the administration of things set forth, as also found in other scriptures. And I think today, more than any time, there needs to be a great amount of grace for ministers and their officiation, and not toleration for excessive sins. What I mean by that is this, you have ministers that profess to be called of God, and only God knows, and they may end up in an adulterous affair. And then the people will say, oh, that's okay, uh, we'll forgive them. And that shouldn't have been tolerated. Then you'll have a pastor that decides he likes a red carpet rather than a blue carpet, and you'll have a group of Christians that want to assassinate him because they don't like his judgment. Both of them are bizarre. Both of them are totally contrary to the scriptures and understand the divine nature. Blameless has to do with being without fault. Speaks of uh, two important individuals in the book of Luke, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. In other words, they were living a good life according to God's word. And that's what God expects of a minister of the gospel. God has high moral standards. But, you know, he expects the same thing from every Christian. It's just down to whom much is given will men require the more. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now, notice here that... Paul was not sinless. God forgave him because he was zealous, but he was persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he didn't understand truth and grace until he was converted, and then God said he would show him what things he would suffer. And Paul suffered a lot in the ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Christians should have the willingness to suffer for righteousness sake, and especially the pastor. The idea is being a responsible minister of the Lord, fulfilling the function of the office, that no one could justly or rightly accuse him of misconduct. But the adversary often accuses unjustly. And you need to see the bishop of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. We know he was sinless, but look here. Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, 
we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Notice that they have declared him a malefactor without any evidence, without any proof. It's just merely a rallying accusation. And, they're, and look at the way they're putting it to Pilate. Well, if there wasn't something wrong with him, we wouldn't have brought him to you. But they never produced any evidence. They just accused him. And if a man is called to the ministry, he'll need to understand that he'll be accused of many things. His responsibility is not to be guilty of them. The Lord Jesus Christ was not guilty. He was not a malefactor, but they were saying he was. The other thing that you want to note is the number of people that were willing to believe it without proof or evidence, just rallying accusations. Um, that's what America Judas, uh, Judas Jurisprudence, excuse me. American jurisprudence was based on a man is innocent to proven guilty. In a court of law, you have to bring and substantiate facts and evidence. Your accusations are not admissible. You have to prove it. And here there was no need to prove it. And sad to say, that's the case today with slanderous tongues and railing accusations. Mean, wicked, uh, Things are often said by people about people, and they have no truth to them. And I don't know what's more wicked, those that say it or those that foolishly, stupidly, blindly believe it. Arbitrary opinions are certainly not of God. They often come of evil and wicked men, and they should never come from Christians. Obey them that have the rule over you. And submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, as that they must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Now, the minister's jurisdiction over the congregation is spiritual, and it extends to the church. Your life is between you and God. You come to church to receive instruction and teaching in the way of God, and you're merely expected to just behave yourself as any courteous individual would. Now, if a church should have standards. If you want to be in a position of leadership, just as the pastor is, you will be expected and asked to uh, meet higher standards. We ask um, if you're going to play the piano or the organ that you put on a, a suit and a tie or a dress male or female. If you come to the, sit in the congregation, um, we ask that you come dressed so that you're uh, not lewd. That simple. You'll have people today that want to come into your church dressed lewd, and they think they have a right to do that. You'll have people say, well, I want to serve, I want to, I want to be a leader, but I want to do it without any moral standards. There, the, the minister as the overseer, it's his responsibility to set the standards and to see that the church services are conducted decency and order. Ministers have most of the problems they have because people, through pride, believe that they have the right to have this liberty to do anything they darn well please. You don't have that right in the church. You have that right in your home. You have that right in your... But there you're restricted to your marital relationship, or you're restricted to your government laws and regulations. And there really shouldn't be any problem with obeying a pastor or minister in the local church. Because he watches for your soul and he's teaching righteousness. But we have an untoward generation today that um, they think their opinion. Now, if you want to know how simple this is, it's like going to a baseball game. How many have ever been to a baseball game? Okay, they hire a guy called a referee umpire. The umpire gets behind home plate. He goes, strike! And then the people in the peanut gallery start cursing him out. Now the umpire is behind home plate. He, ha he, he in his mind, he's the one that makes the box. It may be from the knees to the elbows, but he draws the box in his mind. He's the only one that can see the box. 
The people in the sands cannot see the box. They do not have the position. Yet, in their liberty and their freedom, they have the right to make all the jeering things they want. But that game is going to rise and fall on the calls of the umpire. They stand. If the umpire says it's a strike, it doesn't matter what Joe Blow or her sister Sharla says, it's a strike. They can get mad and say the umpire is uh, blind, but it's amazing to me their arrogance, and they show what prideful, arrogant people they are. They can't see the box, but they know what the call was. Obviously, the problem of it is, and we find this in the church, called respect of persons. And what it is is this. It's very simple. It's if their team's winning, they're happy with the calls. If their team's losing, they're unhappy with the calls. That's the way it works. I used to run a major wrestling tournament. In fact, I ran the largest tournament in uh, amateur sports ever held in the state of New York. I had 1,200 kids one year in, in a tournament. And uh, 1,200 kids, I probably had about um, 20 to 30 people that were upset somewhere through the tournament, or upset with a referee or upset with this or upset with that. And I can almost guarantee every time their kid had gotten, had lost. Um, and then you have uh, 1,109, uh, 11, excuse me, I said I had 1,200, so it's uh, 1,190, 150 people happy. My math's getting screwed up there, but um, this is the way it is in life. The Bible says, obey them that have ruled over you. All judgment calls belong to the pastor, as the God called, God ordained administrator for the local church, just as balls and strikes are called by an umpire or any official. Now, I understand this all very well. I umpired, I officiated baseball, I officiated football, I was a referee, I was a linesman. I was a umpire. I officiated wrestling. I officiated girls volleyball, girls uh, fast pitch softball, and men's league uh, slow pitch softball, and a couple other sports. There's always somebody that knows, but they don't know what they're talking about. It's the pastor alone. Look what it says. As they that must give account, that they may do it with joy. Today, a lot of Christians do not make the ministry joyful. Because they will not have the grace to allow the pastor to make the calls of a pastor. They have an opinion. God never called them. God never said that they were to voice their opinion. God commanded them to obey them that have the rule over you. And it's not like when you go home, you can't go home and do what you want to do. A Bible-believing pastor will not come to your house and try to tell you how to live your life. When you come here, he'll preach and teach to you the word of God so you'll learn how to live your life. And then it's your responsibility to go home and do with it um, as you see fit before God. That's the other thing. Uh, the Bible teaches the way of God. Okay, people come in and a preacher will preach a message on the folly of uh, drugs and booze. And people get mad. And it's like, what are you getting mad at? This is God's way. If you want to go live in a bar, go live in a bar. But if you want to learn God's way, God's people... It's not for kings to drink, Old Emmanuel. God's people live a different life. And the minister's not here to teach you how to live ungodly. He's here to preach and teach for you to live godly. Now, what does God require of the minister? The pastor alone will give account to the Lord for all his judgment calls to God and, he, and not to the congregation, and he's not subject to individual people's uh, opinions. But look at what God says. 
Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Of course, a faithful man will always be accused of misconduct. And the more biblically he conducts himself, the more and more accusations and revilings he's going to receive, as the idea here matches 1 Peter. Look at 1 Peter, and this is for all Christians to learn. The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. The pastor, as a mature Christian, is to make sure the charges against him are without cause. Every judgment call of every authority can be criticized and easily argued to another position. This happens in politics every day, but the church is not in the business of politics. Look, anything can be criticized and made to turn evil. So the pastor has um, a Volkswagen uh, that's rusted. Then he's a loser and a bum. The pastor has a Cadillac then he's greedy and he's a thief. You see, uh, the pastor has a mid-size, then he's a compromiser. You see how easy that is? You say, how do you know it's that easy? Because as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I've endured this for 34 years of my life. When somebody doesn't like you, or when somebody's angry against you or upset against you, and a lot of times it's because of something that happened in their life. <laughs> it doesn't even really concern you. They, just, they can find fault. You can find fault with anything. I think this was a beautiful pulpit. Somebody can come in and, and look how easy to criticize it. Well, look at that. He put a cross on there. I thought we weren't supposed to have any graven image of anything. See, you can criticize it. Well, what's it doing being oak? Shouldn't it have been? Uh, that was just uh, too much money spent on, I hope it's oak, <laughs> An oak, that should have been made out of uh, cheap plywood. You see, you see how you can criticize anything? And you know what? Miscontent, discontented people do. Be content with such things as you have. Now, you'll have the same thing as Christians. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Notice that? The pastor that's following the Lord is always ready to give advice, help, and leadership to a congregation, but he doesn't go stick his nose in other people's business. Yet if any man suffers a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. This is expressed to Timothy to live soberly, righteously, and godly, so as not to invoke or cause men to despise him. Look at Second um, or Timothy 2.11. And this is important for Christians because these scripture verses are also going to all of us. For the grace of God, that's a non-merited favor. Now, you have something that's wonderful from God. You have a gift of eternal life. And that means you have a God that gave you complete and absolute liberty because he forgave your past sins, your present sins, and your future sins. And your liberty in Christ is a wonderful thing because that protects you from all the criticisms of men. Because, you see, it doesn't matter what men criticize. You're going to give account to God. And God gave you his grace. And he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. Paul lived a life that was godly, teaching us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. 
looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority that no man despise thee. And the only way that you can do that is to live a godly life, but you're still going to get despised. Um, I was online the other day, and there was an individual, and uh, I, I could, I could, just the way they said it, it was, you know, I, I can give you, who oh, are they pay pastors? Why should a minister be paid? Well, um, they got the same problem that you have. They like to eat food. They got the same problem you have. They like to put some clothes on. They got the same problem that you have. They like to be in the house with heat. <laughs> Isn't that awful wicked of them to just want to be human beings and, and, and live a normal life? I don't think you should pay a pastor. He should just starve to death and, and go naked and barefoot. Isaiah did. I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are awful rough on their pastors. I, won't want, I wouldn't want to be the Christian that has to face God. I mean, you just live with bird brains. And I have to forgive them, and I do. But it isn't easy sometimes. Because I don't have it, I, I don't suffer too much on myself. But boy, when they go after my family or my kids, that's hard to, that's hard to take. I don't allow that. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. And therein is the issue. If your pastor has not violated any of the 23 death sentences of the Old Testament, like rape and murder and adultery, then people's opinions don't count as far as his ministry goes. You'll have people that, well, we just think we need a new pastor because he chose uh, uh, blue drapes. And that's just not very wise. And because he chose blue drapes, nobody's coming to church. Are you nuts? I don't think anybody cares whether the drapes are blue or not. It makes any difference whether anybody ever comes to church. But those are the lame, stupid things that go through congregations. You say, oh, no, people can't. I've been a pastor for 34 years. I've listened to that junk for 34 years. You say, what do you do? I try to glorify God. And it's very hard sometimes because it hurts. It's like, don't I ever get a break? And I speak for all pastors. This is not common to just your pastor. This is not a personal thing. I, I know all the good men of God, and I talk and visit. I know what they've been through. And I know the way people treat them. And you have to wonder, are they saved? Do they have a, anything to do with the divine spirit? I mean, now, I have to know the truth. The truth is, God's good. But even a lot of his saints that get on their face and ask for his mercy and forgiveness, just like in the Bible... Just like that fella who owed his master so much and the master forgave him. And then that rascal, after he got forgiven, he had no mercy on his fellow man. A lot of immature Christians like that. Don't be like that. Don't be like that with each other. Don't be like that with your spiritual leaders. Don't be like that with your wives. Don't be like that with your husbands. Don't even be like that with your children. When serving the Lord in the ministry, you will often find the spiritual holier-than-thou group of brethren despising you for your faithful service in humility to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the verse of your defense against the many fabricated charges of defamation. And of course, now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Why did they want to murder him? He didn't harm anybody. He didn't steal anybody's car. 
He didn't take anybody's wife. He didn't burn down anybody's house. In fact, when he was near people that were dying or died, they resurrected in his presence. When people were hungry, he fed them. When people were blind, he opened their eyes. <laughs> Wouldn't you want a friend like that? Wouldn't you want to say, hey, come on, stay at my house. I might have a heart attack tonight. I'd like you to be there. You're better than a doctor. But they sought false witnesses to put him to death. If they could make up false charges to the crucifixion of a sinless man, the Son of God, how easily shall they find accusation against a weak and mortal man? Now, if you're going into ministry, if you want to be a minister, you've got to be able to take it. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master, and the servant as his Lord. Now, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, and that's what they accuse, the Lord is casting demons out of people and healing people, and they say he's doing it by the devil. How much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. You know what's good? You know that God's going to talk to everybody about these things someday and it's going to be serious so persecuted as the Lord and his apostles so shall they malign his disciples and their pastor so the man who would be a servant of God should answer his critics as the apostle Paul answered his critics now when I'm thinking and I get assailed here's what I give people and you should have this for your own defense. 1 Corinthians 4.1 Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. That's what God's looking for. Can you take it? See, the world thinks, oh, is he beautiful? Is he good looking? Is he intelligent? Is he... Can you take it? Can you keep teaching God's truth, receiving rejection, receiving despisings for God's sake, and keep taking it and remain faithful and not be moved the way far too many ministers compromise and then become corrupt? Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. I judge not my own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified, but he that judges me is the Lord. It's God that judges us. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then shall every man have praise of God." Now, in order for people to be like that, I'll tell you what's wrong with them. They have no fear of God. I'm here to tell you, if God doesn't address it in this life, and in most cases he does, because judgment must begin first at the house of God, he will address it in the life to come in a most serious manner of great gravity. So I got saved, I'm not going to hell. Well, there's a lot more to eternity than hellfire and damnation. And there's a lot more seriousness to eternity than hellfire and damnation. Now, hellfire and damnation leaves you in a position that has no recourse. All those who enter here must abandon all hope, so you better get saved. On the other hand, there's a whole lot to the eternity that I have not seen, nor in the heart of men, that God has for them that love him. And he doesn't have things for those who don't other than he gave them a gift of eternal life and that's why God leaves us here to see what we'll do with the new life he's given us and if we'll serve him our love and enjoy so persecute they the Lord and his apostles show so they malign his disciples 
and their pastor, so the man who would want to be a servant of God should answer the critics as the Apostle Paul did. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the heart. Then shall every man have praise of God. And what you're going to have is this. And people never stop and think about this. They listen to people criticizing all the time, and they don't even have enough sense to see where somebody's at. Okay? Um, I ran my wrestling tournament. 1,200 kids. Started off with 300 kids came first time. 300, got about 600, got about 800, got about 1,200. And most of the time, it averaged about 800 kids. And every year, somebody criticized, oh, you just run it wrong. Did you ever run a wrestling tournament? Did you ever have that many kids come in? Did you ever have most all the people happy? Well, who do you think you are? Where is your, where is your success? Where is your proof? Most of the time, the people that criticize, and I have to say this as kind as I can, are losers. That's why they're losers because they sit around criticizing and they don't go do something. When you go do something, you learn. You learn it isn't as easy as you think it is. I'll give you a good illustration. As a young man, I had a good vision. When I first got married, I was poor like everybody else. And I was able to borrow some money. And so I saw this old house, and I looked at that house, I walked through it, and it was just all run down, and I, I had a vision. I, I saw how I could remodel it and do all this stuff and, and make a nice place for my wife and I and sell it and then get something better. So I borrowed the money, and I had some money saved. I bought the house, and um, we went in and started fixing it up. It took us... Uh, I took the uh, first few weeks of my vacation and then um, working on it nights and evenings and everything. And I'll tell you what, that was the first time I never knew what I was doing. I learned all along the way, a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors, a lot of repeats. I ended up with an ulcer off of that. I got the job finished, and we sold it and made a profit. But I'll tell you what, once was enough. I lost interest in doing that again. I'm glad I did it when I did. Try it sometime. It's, but I can tell you this, it's real easy to sit there and imagine it. It's a whole other thing to uh, do it. You know, if, if you know what you're doing, and you've got, and this is what I would tell people, and you got it all together, you got all the answers, why aren't you doing it? Are you lazy? You got no confidence in yourself? I mean, if you know what you're doing, do it. Now, what you're dealing with, and I hope you're not being offended by it, you're dealing with the human nature, the creature as, as the beast really is. The husband of one wife. When a man has taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her. Then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. Now this is very important, because the pastor should be blameless. And there's some teachings that are exactly correct, but there's a bad and wrong spirit there. Okay? God allows the divorce to take place, but God is not in favor of divorce. And divorce is really ends up being a, it's a failure of the divine spirit. If uh, two people love the Lord and they love each other, they're never going to have a divorce. Divorces come through lack of love. Now the pastor is to be faithful to the wife he has and is not to be found in a position of blame for the failure of the marriage vow if he is abandoned by some uncleanness that might be found by an unreasonable, ungraceful wife. And that works both ways. Because here it's the man, and generally the man 
uh, it, it was more of a man's world than it is today, and so it was written to the man. But it works both ways. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. God hates divorce, though. You see, there's a simple cure for divorce called love and maturity. For the Lord, the God of Israel, say that he hateth putting away. And watch it. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Love is not that hard if people aren't selfish. If a man says, I love you to a woman, and he really does, he's going to sacrifice for her. If a woman says to her husband, I love you, and he really does, she's going to sacrifice for him. They are not going to have a divorce. Are you that stupid to get rid of somebody that's sacrificing for you? Sometimes people are. Sometimes people don't appreciate what they have. Sometimes the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence, but I guarantee you it's always got a higher water bill. There's a price to pay. God hates divorce for immature reasons or irreconcilable differences. You say, well, the wife and I, we have a real shaky marriage. Well, you want to know how to get the shakes out of it? Forgive. Look at them from the divine perspective and say, no. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgive. Forgive, forgive, forgive. Now, forgiveness does not always imply trust. In fact, most of the time, it doesn't. Forgiveness is just, I'm not going to retaliate. I'm not going to hold a grudge against you. God expects us to have character in regard to our vows. Now, when a man goes into ministry, he makes a vow to God. When a man gets married, he makes a vow to his wife. And when a woman gets married, she makes a vow to her husband. And marriage is set before God. It's the institution ordained of God in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Ecclesiastics 5.4 When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay, for hath no pleasure in fools, pay that which thou hast vowed. Now I've told people for years, I could have a divorce, I could have had a divorce, I'm not having one now. And you say, how do you know that? Because I'm absolutely completely in control. My wife <laughs> couldn't leave me unless I push her down the, down the street with a wheelchair. I'm not divorcing her. You say, why is that? I made her a vow. I said, for better or for worse, in sickness and health, to death we do part. She got a vow from a man of God. She got a vow from a man that believes in God, that wants to follow his God. And his God said to him, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And my Savior's never left me for, or forsaken me. And I told my wife that I was a Christian man. I'd never leave her or forsake her. And she did the same. And she lived the same. And that's one of the reasons I'm now ever going to forsake her. You say, what's that? Godly Christian character of a godly man. That's the way men are to be to their wives, and that's the way wives are to be to their husbands. You say, well, didn't you and her have some rough times, some arguments and fights? Yeah, what did I tell you? called forgiveness. And then grow up and become mature and give rather than demand. It's amazing how giving rather than demanding changes things. When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow then thou shouldest vow and not pay. Suffer not thy mouth to cause thy flesh to sin, neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thy hands? Do you know what the most expensive thing in life is other than dying? And generally it's more expensive than dying. D-I-V-O-R-C-E. 
I'll tell you, when two people get married and they have a divorce, they usually squander in that divorce fight all their, all their goods. For in the multitude of dreams, in many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God. Two Christians fearing God and loving each other never have a divorce. However, when abandoned by a spouse, a brother or sister is not under bondage to vows that are broken by another's conduct. You cannot stop people and make people, you cannot stop them from doing wrong, and you cannot change people from doing wrong. And sometimes Christians are very cruel. If you do right and your spouse abandons you, remember, they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. But if the unbelieving depart, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. If they leave, you're free from your bond. It's beyond your control. Marriages require much grace from both sides to prosper. Now here's the secret, and I've already talked about it. And of his fullness have we all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. You ever been treated nice? Do you enjoy it? Do the same to somebody else. I bet you they'll enjoy it. I don't think there's too many people that'll leave if you treat them nice. But some people are just so miserable, they don't know how to even receive being treated nice. And if they leave, count a blessing. You've been freed from the oppression of a hard, unforgiving, callous, mean-spirited person. Marriages require much grace from both sides to prosper. For marriages to work requires faithfulness on both parts. Psalm 5.8. Are we getting cold out there? A little? See, that's, I'm your pastor, and I need to be concerned about you. See? You're going to be husbands and wives, you need to be concerned about each other. Grace for grace. Psalm 5, 8. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of my enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongues. Learn this lesson. Nice is not necessarily godly, but godly is nice. Destroy them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. That is the shortcoming of all human relationships without the bond of God. Now, here's God's spirit. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Long-suffering lasts for a long time. Eventually it must come to an end. However, the stronger the love, the longer the charity. Ephesians says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. A Christian is not to be blamed if the spouse dies without mischief. Now, I had to say that because we live in such a wicked world today, and that's why you'll have a hard time going to the hospitals today. You go down to the hospital, and you've got to show an ID card to get in the hospital. Well, why do you have to do that? Because some wicked man went down to the hospital with a gun and killed his wife. That's why, that, that's, why that's your ID, and that's why hospitals check everybody before they let them in. 
So if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is freed from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. You cannot stop your spouse from dying on you. We all die at God's appointed time. And therefore, when death occurs, the marriage ends and you're free. A Christian is not to be blamed. A Christian is not to be blamed if a spouse abandons them without just cause. And I'm throwing this in. I'm speaking on permission. Um, I think I missed these scriptures. We're going to skip by them. Go to this. 1 Corinthians seven twelve. But to the rest speak I not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let her not put her away. See how easy it is? Just be pleased to dwell. And the woman which hath a husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. Now, a lot of people will try to say, well, that's only if they're saved, born again Christian. Well, versus a lost person. How do you know who's saved and who's lost? Only God knows that. You can only go by what people say. I think you're going to have to apply it to everybody. It's a common practice. If a person leaves and the other person's done their duty as a spouse, they're free. Yes, the context here is that of a lost spouse, but the fact that a saved spouse should not depart is because of their unbelief in the Word of God, or excuse me, unsaved spouse. All right, back to Numbers again. So if a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Now, you know, we call that character. And my question is, how much character do you have? Because your Lord's character was such that when his father asked him to go to the cross, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. He shall do all according to proceed out of his mouth. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being her father's house in her youth. So God and the pastor do not believe in divorce. God allows it because of the hardness of people's hearts. And I'll be honest with you, so they don't kill one another. But God doesn't believe in divorce. And sometimes somebody's going to abandon you and leave you, and you can't do anything about that. And God is not going to cause you to suffer under that. And even today, I'm going to speak again by permission. If you have a spouse that's endangering your life and limb, if you leave, I don't believe you're a divorcee. I believe you're a refugee. I wouldn't stay in a house where somebody's trying to kill me or somebody's trying to hurt me. But on the other hand, when people, this is a saying that people don't like today. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Yeah, it may be a verbal abuse, and people shouldn't behave that way, but I think you ought to be tough enough and gracious enough to forgive people. If you're going to be in the ministry to be a pastor, you're going to have to forgive people for verbal abuse all of your ministry. It's just a natural thing. Paul received a lot of physical abuse. Those who are living by faith do not seek to harm others, though they are often harmed. Now here's, um, where am I? At? I was, did I go too far? Well, I'll tell you what. First uh, Corinthians numbers. Matthew 9, 8. That takes me. You know what's good when time starts running out? It's, and you end up messing up? Punt. It's time to go home. Pick this one up next week. I don't know what I did wrong, but I got my scriptures uh, out of position. Uh, any questions? 
basic thing is this. Charity covereth a multitude of sins. Learn to have grace. Learn to have forgiveness. Speak kindly, affectionate one to another. Learn to forgive. And um, don't put yourself in a position where you're really threatened with harm. The Lord will deliver you. You won't be tempted above. He'll give you a way to escape. But the divine spirit is to be harmless. Harmless. The Lord Jesus Christ was holy, harmless, undefiled, and separate from sinners. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege to be Christians. Father, we thank you for your goodness, and we thank you for your blessings. Thank you for your truths. In Jesus' name we pray.